welcome to This Week in Game 287, where we read and distill all the weekly game industry news so you don't have to. You get your fix from us. Here's what we're going over today, amongst a, a lot of stuff. Phil is so excited to throw up on the Voodoo Be Real acquisition. Actually, I think he's excited about it. I thought you were going to throw up on it, and then you surprised me by saying you think this is brilliant. So we're going to get so the many other angles. take. So many angles. Okay. All right, hold on, hold on, we'll get there. It's been brewing this. <laughs> Pre-reg announcements and marketing are a thing now, so we've got a lot of talk going on with pre-reg today. Mishka breaks a rule and talks about both Embracer and Netflix. So this is a... No a, rules a, rule. That's, that's yeah, the book, that, right? Yes, that is the Netflix book. And then Cress gets triggered from all of this. We, we promise to try to keep it to new information on these topics only and not revisit the past. Although there, there might be a touch, might be a touch of that. So hi, I am Jen Donahoe, strategic marketing consultant at Beta Hat and Jade Inferno. And today we have Philip Black, game economist at Game Economist Consulting. Hey, hey. Eric Kress, principal at Gossamer Consulting Group. What up, punks? And Mishka Katkoff, king of Spain, because he's still in Spain, and deconstructor of fun. Uh, hola, como es? Uh, <laughs> I actually, I don't know. I don't know a lick of Spanish because my wife speaks such a fluent Spanish that I just walk around and look pretty. That's my role here and just, and just carry the uh, uh. The, the stuff. <laughs> oh, that's funny. Uh, well, did you or your wife happen to watch WWDC or Dub Dub, as if you're one of the in people, you call it Dub Dub? So as an AI fan, I thought this was pretty interesting. They also announced iOS 18's game mode, and I thought, I just had to bring this up because I thought it would trigger Cress, that they announced <laughs> that basically this allows you to play more HD games or full console games on your phone, and that's what Apple's really going after in all their announcements. Yeah, they, they, they're super friendly to the gaming community and game publishers <laughs> of all ilks. Now, this continuing, they just don't give a shit about games. They just want to continue the upgrade cycle and push, which is great, good business for them. Obviously, AI is the latest thing. Holy crap, like you need a 15 Pro to, to play, to even use Apple AI. I actually have a 15 Pro. I'm, I'm actually a little bit excited about I the in integration. Like, it feels far more practical if it's actually integrated with a device that you use on a daily basis as opposed to like kind of a one-off, even though ChatGPT is amazing and, and that, that stuff. And then maybe they fix Siri. I don't know. I'm, yeah. I am actually a little bit excited about this. This actually, and the stock has been up dramatically in anticipation of this announcement and this announcement. But I guess the one thing that I'm concerned about that seems to be concerning for most people is that the privacy issues around this, like creating like an LLM or some kind of model based upon your usage of your actual device on a regular basis seems a little sketchy, right? Like, it, you know, like all that information available in some form, I don't know. That seems like a pretty big hurdle for them, but they don't see, here's the thing. And this is the same rant. I always give Apple doesn't give a fuck, right? All they want to do is sell phones. Privacy was the last strategy, right? They clearly don't give a shit about privacy. They're letting everyone use fingerprinting now. Like it's everywhere, right? Everyone's jacking IP addresses, identifying individual users. We're back. We're back in it, dude. They don't care. You know, that whole privacy message was just a fucking marketing ploy. And so the same thing here, you know, this is going to enable potentially some amazing features on the phone and, and it'll help push obsolescence and make people upgrade phones. Good. Done. Business. Yeah. It's, it's literally the yeah. first time that people are going to feel the need to upgrade in like three or four phones yeah. on the privacy stuff. I think they haven't abandoned them yet. They did talk about the reason why you need the powerful phone is a lot of the compute that happens for the AI is going to happen on the phone and they're not sharing that information back to the cloud. Apparently they're not training your data on it. They say, but I thought of you because I was like, as much as the vision pro was a fail, this Apple intelligence is that much more of a win. Yeah, totally. They just announced that they're not going after a big upgrade path for the, uh, the vision pro. Yeah. They're going to focus on a lower end device or something like that. Yeah. Okay. I mean, wasn't that obvious from the get-go that $3,500 device makes no fucking sense? Yeah. Um, <laughs> Stock is up by over 12% after the announcement. So that's, yeah. in money-wise, that's a lot. I can't even, like, what's no. that, $3 trillion company? And when that goes up by 12% or... Not as anyways. much as Leather Daddy Jensen, who went on <laughs> oh, stage yeah, that's true. 
With HP and NVIDIA is now the largest company in the world. That's um, bonkers. Because I told my wife who, who day trades and she does like options and stuff. I'm like, go get his speaking schedule, Jensen's from NVIDIA, the NVIDIA CEO, and just buy calls before any speaking engagement he has in the next couple of months. <laughs> she did it yesterday, actually. And she's like, look, I'm good. I made money. Yeah, none of whatever is said on this podcast is not investment advice, by the way. But I do have to say, like, his interviews are, how would I put it? They're, like, so sobering when he talks about how hard it is to be. Like, I would never do this again, even if I knew the outcome. Like, he goes to Stanford and just, just like, make, like makes a reality check to all these young kids how incredibly hard it is. So this guy is a, is a fascinating speaker talking about authenticity. We never got to that Discord article, but like this is one of the probably most authentic speaker in business at the moment. Yeah, totally agree. All right, let's keep going. Uh, Shill, Mishka. Uh, yes, uh, Shill. So episode from this Monday, uh, we had an episode come out with Clang Founder. So they're... CEO and CTO, Odur and Mundi, uh, Icelandic powerhouses, came in on the podcast. So the company has been live for 11 years, and they've released one game in, I think, in 2016. That was the other day. And it's a fascinating story because they're based out of Berlin, and they've raised $77 million over six rounds. And every time they raise, and it's like tens of millions that they raise, they still haven't shipped the game. So it's a super fun chat. Mundi is a very charismatic CEO, and as a CEO of a startup, he has done excellent because his main job is to raise funding, and boy, oh boy, does he do that. The conversation goes everywhere. He talks at one point where, where they did a pitch so bad, I think it was to LVP, that they got sued afterwards. Like, it's, it's an insane, insane conversation. And, um, you know, clearly what they're doing resonates with the venture capitalists or they just really want to hang out with Mundi. It's either or, probably both. So, but it's, it's a like fun Elon. conversation. I, yeah. yeah, how about making a game or making a product? What about that? Um, have you th heard about Web3? Never release. And oh, that's, that's true. <laughs> that's, that's, just keep, the, keep it alive. Yeah. Keep the good part about the story is, is that his grandfather was the first person to kind of bankroll them when they were, you know, living the life in Berlin. And his grandfather got out. So when he they did the Series A, his grandfather made like millions out of it because he got to sell his stock already. So uh, if somebody made it, it's grandfather Vondi uh, is uh, is a millionaire now of Clang. So it's a you know good investor. All right, so anyway. check that out, Phil. I give you the floor to Voodoo on Voodoo. All right, so I think I think we got to start. I guess maybe not with a correction, but with an update. We finally have confirmation from multiple news outlets that $500 million was, in fact, not the acquisition price for Be Real, <laughs> but instead that represents a performance based maximum. And so the actual price paid looks like, I think it was around 100 to 120 million uh, in cash and stock. So that is a very, very different deal than 500 million acquisition. There is so many freaking angles to this, I don't even know where to start. So I think the first one that seems to be overlooked is the antitrust angle. So the fact that this thing sold, I would argue for peanuts at 100 million. At 500 million, that's ridiculous. And we'll talk why 500 million was ridiculous, but 100 million, that's like nothing. And so why would it sell for so little beyond just the KPIs and the inability to raise another round? It's the fact that the United States cannot bid on a company like this because the antitrust department would be, uh, would be all up over them. There'd be lawsuits, they would drag it out. It is not a friendly environment for acquisitions. Zuck, Zuck would have loved this. I mean, even the dark horses for TikTok right now that get mentioned like Amazon and Walmart, I'm sure they'd be interested in this, but the Justice Department won't allow it, or at least they'll drag it out so it's painful for everyone. And that ultimately harms everyone. It harms US companies, it harms a French company that could have gotten a bigger out for those VCs, and ultimately it lowers the amount of capital that is gonna flow into venture if you do not have reasonable outs. So it's super, it's super disappointing to see this. Um, I think there could have been a much better outcome for everyone if the Justice Department was not on an ideological tear right now. So I think that's that's been missing in these takes. I think there's the media angle because everyone was rushing, rushing to report this $500 million headline. And the defense given was that if you read the PR release from Vudu, they start with the statement that it was gonna be for 500. They do not go into more specifics, but if you read another line, 
they kind of cast a little bit of doubt on this and everyone was running with this headline. I've seen very few corrections, by the way, to this $500 million headline. And there's only one person that seemed to raise a couple questions about this. And that was Eric Seifert, former host hey, of the cast. Oh, 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 wait, I was first. I was first on the podcast. What are you talking I, I, he, about? He, he might have beat you on the tweets. He might have beat you on the tweets. He had it very quickly on the tweets. He was highlighting right. the second line of the press release that seemed to ca cast a little bit of smoke on the $500 million number, but leave it, leave it to the analysts to be able to call this into question. There was also a Business Insider article that came out with the CEO of Voodoo, I believe, which also cast more cold water on the $500 million. That was very close to the original press release that didn't get a lot of pickup. So I would say that's the second angle is that I think the media failed us a little bit in being able to cover this or at least raise some questions or at least even give us the update. And it was the analysts that seemed to have won. The fourth estate kind of let us down. It was the fifth estate that seems to be winning right now. To be clear, as I said in my post with Eric Seifert's thing, is that this was PR brilliance, right? I mean, they put out a press release that was so misleading <laughs> that... Everyone believed it, right, on their blog, right? So this was PR doing what they do in order to make something feel bigger and better than it was to save face for the valuation and make a bigger splash. So, I mean, I, they did their job. Good job. Whoever the PR guy of Voodoo is, good. Good for you, man. You did it. Sir, I certainly, I don't know if I want to blame them, but I would say that was a very misleading opening line in their press release. Of course. Um, they did not cast like, pretty much any doubt about the 500 million. Right. So, I mean, right. I don't know if I want to credit for that. So I would say there's the third angle, which is the linkfluencer angle. So this thing gets announced. There's a rush, rush of takes. And this happens whenever there's an ironic acquisition by an ironic acquirer, is we got to have the rush, the rush of takes. And everyone was going bananas. This is genius. It is a games company buying a social media company. They're going to use all these cool gamification techniques. There's going to be cross promotion. I mean, come on, Zynga called. It wants its, what, 2010 F Farmville strategy back? Like, who, <laughs> who, who's doing this anymore? And and if you run some of the back of the envelope math and you say, okay, it's going to be 500 million, you know, we have around 40 million DAU, you start to think about, okay, what would the LTV be? It's around $13. Okay, let's look at some comparables for this. Facebook reports their ARPU. Facebook has reported their ARPU for a really long time. And so we can see what best in class ARPU looks like. So again, I, I want to remind you that like Facebook is one of, you know, God's greatest monetization engines ever created. And if you go back to at least, let's say 2019, you're looking at about six bucks a user. So they could probably recoup this, you know, 2019 Facebook could recoup this probably in two quarters. But you got to remember like what it takes to get an ARPU like this. So not only do you need to have the ab tech down, which you can come back to. But the other thing you need to do is you need to get the turnstile right. And the turnstile is about increasing engagement because the ARPU that they get is tied to that. You can show more ads and you're going to hit ads more frequently the more time you spend on Facebook. So you need to grow what people do on the platform. So this has been like the move to subscribing to pages, subscribing to artists, getting outside your local network is how you increase engagement. Instagram did a brilliant job at doing this. This is how they get more people to go through their monetization turnstile, which is super effective. And this is Be Real's problem right now. I'm a, I'm a frequent Be Real user, and they are struggling to get people outside of your local network. So I have about four or five friends that are on Be Real. I do use it pretty consistently. There isn't a lot of gamification techniques, but ultimately, like, how are they going to get me into other profiles? How are they going to increase the size of my network? That is the big challenge that be Real has had. They've tried to throw me brands, but it's just not the same. You can't plan posts. It kind of goes against the app, which is supposed to be spontaneous. It's supposed to be kind of lame. Most of my friends are just, you know, they're work from home. So what do I get? I get a bunch of keyboards and screens. That's, that's what I get every day. But yet somehow there's, there's this addictiveness to it because you can't see other users' posts until you post your own. So there's kind of this if-then statement they've created. So if you start to think about it, like, okay, they don't have ads. They got to get this turnstile up. Who could be a good pair for this? Voodoo makes a lot of sense. Voodoo makes a lot of sense because they have BWiz, or excuse me, Wiz, which is their social network that is pretty big in France, which from sources I've talked to at Voodoo tell me that they grew that social network almost exclusively through user acquisition. So it was not kind of this organic K factor you usually get with social networks. It was doing what Voodoo does best, which is being a publisher, which I think is the direction they want to go. They want to be a publisher, not necessarily a games publisher, but a publisher in and of itself. You saw Scope 
Scopely a long time ago with a press release about the Scopely OS, brilliant brand from Javier. They want to be a publisher that they can take anything that is an app, whether it be a game or not, and be able to grow this thing. And they can slap on an ad network on top of this, which they've announced they're going to do. There's another interview with their CEO that came out recently. I believe it was on The Verge. They also talked about that the fact this isn't going to be a cross promotion. They confirm this. I wrap all this up. And I would say, I think this is a brilliant acquisition. I think that being able to get this for $100 million at the user scale they did, being able to say, hey, look, it, let's take a real shot on whether or not we can move from games publisher to publisher. And ultimately, who doesn't want a social network? This is an advertiser's dream. This is an advertiser's dream. We know some of those valuable companies in the world are social networks. Let's take a shot at this $100 million. I think that is a brilliant strategic decision. I wish them the best. Let's keep an eye on this. Let's see if they can grow it. Let's see if they can grow it. They can slap an ad network on it. Let's see what they can do. But this is a bet I want to take. We don't do financial advice, but let's look at that voodoo stock. <laughs> oh, my Lord. Not a public stock, though. <laughs> I mean, thanks, Phil. It's good that you got, you know, a week to marinate this and come up with a thesis because you started off with weak arguments around that 500, the LTV, kind of like the normal playbook. And now you had a week and you became like a financial analyst over here. <laughs> you want us over. We're here cheering for voodoo. This is it. Like personally, I would say talking to the people there, it feels to me even more product focused organization than the Zingas and Scopelys that are you know, often saying that we are the product people, our product managers go to Metas and the Pinterests and Googles and so forth. But in that company, they were so focused inside of it not to only grow games, they grow any apps. And I think this fits perfectly and they have a app division already well-functioning. They got their games going on and out social network. It's a true, as you said, a publishing platform, a product-driven company, as product as I've ever seen. That's all you got? That's all I got. I'm just supporting okay. Phil. I'm giving the right. um, keep the it real. Edge right. be, to this be real. Analysis. Give us some be real. Oh God. I'm gonna be real right now. No, They're okay. buying a social network with no revenue and no advertising whatsoever, right? So it's like in its infancy. And so this is what we know as pure multiple arbitrage, which is on the slide today, right now. If you're watching the YouTube thing, is they are a company that trades at like three times revenue according to the comps. And they're buying a company that will, in theory, trade at nine times revenue. And so what they're hoping for is that their revenue that they make now will now trade at nine times revenue or be valued at nine times revenue instead of the three, right? Because they are now a social network as opposed to a gaming thing. So this is complete, like, kind of bullshit in a way, right? Because they have no business right now on the social side and they have to build a business from scratch. But... In theory, it could work. I think these voodoo guys are actually relatively brilliant in terms of uh, positioning and 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 selling themselves. And so this may work, but ultimately this is the same setup as what happened with Unity, right? Because Unity positioned themselves as something completely different than they were, and it blew up on them. And I'm not going to go over that rant again. And so they have a lot of execution to do in order to get where they need to go and not screw over every shareholder that buys their stock in the next like you know six to 12 months so we'll see if they can pull it off and actually make a go of this and actually build something here but i am uh, skeptical at best for these type of big moves or transitions for companies at 100 million dollars you're telling me you wouldn't take a swing at this you just described upside to me when i look <laughs> at these multiples what, here's what i think is going to happen if, if you gun to my head i think voodoo wins and shareholders lose how about that? Like, I think they actually can position this in a way that makes them very wealthy by selling the dream, but I don't think the dream will become a reality for investors. That's what I think is going to happen, similar to what happened with Unity, right? So if Voodoo wins, some of the investors always win as well, like the early investors, right? Because you said investors, Voodoo wins, investors lose, but you mean like the investors will and Voodoo goes public. Yeah, if they went public or they get acquired by someone else or whatever, those are the investors that lose. All right, let's keep going. Sandbox. Yeah, so so Sandbox News last week got reached out by a couple of people, CEO actually as well of Sandbox, so he's coming oh, on really? the podcast. Uh-oh. <laughs> Uh-oh. Well, you know, <laughs> people do listen to this. So anyways, this is not from the, the CEO. I actually just read the email, but the correction here is, Headquarters on paper is Hong Kong. So we talked about the headquarters. But uh, according to this person, uh, there are no people there, partly due to regulation, but mainly because Animoca Brands is being based there. Real headquarters is actually in Buenos Aires. 
That's interesting. But this is Much the most better. important news. Much better. <laughs> I, w- I would have left Listen. that one on the table. <laughs> yeah. Make Argentina great again. Let's, yeah, make, co- make a correction that actually makes you look better, not worse. This is, this right. is not Moving coming on. from uh, Sandbox. So anyway, this is from DOF Slack channel. But this is the most important correction. So they never actually raised Series C, but it was leaked that they are looking to raise... 400 million at 4 billion valuation. So when Press was saying that they raised on 400 billion. <laughs> oh my God, it's almost worse. It's almost oh. worse that this thing leaked and they hold couldn't on, get it hold done. On. I, I can't seem to go through a, a sandbox. No, here. because <laughs> these corrections are making everything much worse. It's like you're digging right. a hole. Okay. I'm just reading what was sent to me. The Series C was supposed to happen. And in fact, Series B end of 2021, which was $93 million at an undisclosed valuation led by SoftBank. According to this email, it was $93.5 million on a $500 million valuation. So this news comes in saying that they have crossed a unicorn valuation. They actually doubled. In the PR that we got, <laughs> they, they did not mention this. So it was incredibly confusing. Whoever is doing PR for them is doing a disservice right now. They need to talk to Voodoo. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So Get that agency. I, I I think they're based out of France. I think they need to connect. Ah. Like, listen, whoever you're using for PR is a disaster. Like, <laughs> talk to Voodoo. Let's make a three camera shoot and get this over with. <laughs> Remember the poor PR people. <laughs> PR people aren't the ones who drive the core message. Let's just remember, it usually comes from an executive team that wants to get their message out there. The poor PR people are generally the ones that are like not listened to. However, I get what you're saying. The PR strategy on this was a huge miss. I asked about this actually from a person, and he told me that the goal with this publication, with this PR, were to say like, hey, by the way, We've crossed a unicorn valuation. But the way we received it was like, what the hell? Like you came in at a quarter of the previous. So it felt like that whoever was in charge of this PR strategy, this communication, this this press release did not look at what has happened till this point and just came out with this convertible note news. Okay. Anyways, we're going to have the CEO on the podcast. Uh, just just give us the daily active user chart. They can shut everyone up with that. Yeah. And they won't because there is no daily active users. This thing has been shit on relentlessly, even by crypto. Like when you've lost the crypto community, you've really lost it. <laughs> you've really lost everything. I have some numbers here, but I'm not going to say them. But yeah, actually. The only real correction here, which I will take, is that they didn't spend $500 million in the last three years. So I'll accept that <laughs> as a correction, which is actually... The best news ever, because if they had blown that much money in that period of time, it would be, I don't even think that's fucking possible, to be honest. So they only blew 93 million, right, in the last three years, which is great, right? Better, right? Or somebody Um, was able to invest at a very favorable valuation for 20 million. I don't know. We'll see. Look, $20 million, like, convert is is limping. It's just limping along. And that, that's not a good raise for any company, really, after doing 93 million, right? And the billion dollar valuation is, seems to be bullshit anyway with a $20 million convert. I don't believe any of this shit, really, to be honest. And the reason that the shit leaks for 4 billion is they're trying to get FOMO and get all these VC tourists out there bidding this thing up to $4 billion during like the most insane time period ever in investment in gaming, right? That you'll ever see in our lifetime, right? So... Anyway, this continues to feel very desperate. I'm sure you'll talk to him and he'll paint a rosy picture, but I don't think this is good. Things are not going well at Mr. Sandbox. Let's just say that for almost certainty, okay? So I wish them the best, but like, yeah, this is not look, not a good look. Yeah. I think the key takeaway is having PR for a convertible note is never a good strategy. <laughs> you know those like, sand ooh, timers ooh. that you flip? <laughs> I, we, why didn't they the just sand's do coming this down, it's running the- out. <laughs> I wish they would just do uh, Yeah, you're funny. Okay. I wish they would just do that. Why didn't they just do this on the under? Like like I said last week, uh, there must be a reason why they had to do this. The valuation. That was it. They wanted to say that they are now valued at a unicorn valuation. That, that was, is, to my yeah, understanding, the reason. Absolute what horseshit. What is a unicorn value? So, sorry. Unicorn being like you're valued a billion. Like, listen, if you're a founder, it's nice to say like, hey, I got a billion dollar business. Like, officially. I know, but... <laughs> Okay. All right, moving on. Let's just move on. This is crazy. Bottom of this. Uh. Elevate your game development with Heroic Labs, the cutting-edge platform for building multiplayer games. 
and you need an edge to be successful in today's gaming landscape. Their scalable Nakama server empowers you to create compelling, real-time multiplayer experiences effortlessly. Benefit from features like in-game chat, leaderboards, matchmaking, and more, all designed to enhance engagement and retention. Whether you're developing for mobile, console, or PC, Heroic Labs gives you the tools to bring your community together. Unleash the full potential of your game with Heroic Labs, where every developer is a hero. This podcast is brought to you by Sensor Tower. Sensor Tower has acquired mobile analytics company Data AI, formerly known as We All Know and Love App Annie. Four things you should know. Significant advancement, number one. This acquisition represents a major step forward for Sensor Tower. It expands its customer base, mobile marketing, and app intelligence products, and global presence. Number two, undisputed leadership position. Sensor Tower strengthened its position as the leader in digital marketing and mobile app intelligence through this acquisition. Number three, combined insights. This merger with Data AI allows Sensor Tower to offer customers even stronger and more detailed insights on the digital customer journey. And last, consumer trends. With increasing time spent on digital channels, the combined company is well positioned to capitalize on the growing trend of in-app purchases driven by platforms like Google, Meta, TikTok, YouTube, Instagram, and Snap. Exciting times lie ahead for Sensor Tower and Data AI as they join forces. If you're a customer, reach out to your account director for more information. Not a customer yet? No problem. Schedule a call to explore the innovative digital marketing products they offer. Go to Data AI or SensorTower.com and get on board with undeniably the best data partner in the business. Okay, so just some quick hits on the market. Sensor Tower had a new report. App Store spend. A mobile games saw a 6% increase while Google Play was down 1.4% year on year. For downloads, downloads are slowing down and dropped by 7%. Overall, App Store was flat while Google Play was down 8.5%. So it's interesting to see Google kind of down on both spend and on downloads, Phil would like to point out that with inflation, the overall increase in spend on mobile is about flat because of uh, the impact of inflation. Right, Phil? I hope to cover Matthew Ball's update. He did an update to his state of the gaming piece. And lo and behold, he makes a lot of inflation adjustments and everything looks flat. And again, if you if you bring back inflation, we're looking pretty flat. And more on this, we'll have an episode and a write up next Monday on the Sensor Towers report. So we have Lexi Sido. She was on the podcast. We discussed all these matters, apps, games, transmedia, you name it, and then went through all these numbers. So both podcast and the newsletter piece coming in next Monday. Oh, nice. Okay. Sorry. I did a little uh, a little primer for Lexi. A teaser. A, a teaser, teaser <laughs> if you will. A teaser. <laughs> all right. Um, I'm also seeing a new trend, which is to release milestone download numbers on company social channels. So uh, we were just kind of making fun of PR a little bit. So I think companies are actually going to their own social channels to announce things, likely because there's a lot of inaccurate numbers that are out there. So attention marketing and PR folks, it seems like this is a must-have strategy. And mobilegamer.biz, our friend Neil, will give you free press for it because what he does is goes and scrapes all those social updates and then he pulls them into articles and promotes your stuff. So here's a few that he called out that I saw. You know, also just remember that Scopely did their whole PR tour around Monopoly Go and they got so much PR. In fact, they were featured in Time Magazine as like one of the 100 top companies in tech. So Supercell, Squadbuster pre-reds was announced there. Worthering Wave passed 30 million downloads. Pizza Ready, which is, I think it's a hyper-casual game, hit 100 million downloads. Like we talk a lot about Squadbusters and those bigger games, like 30, 40 million pre-reds. These games are getting download numbers that are in that. Phil has a lot more of those to talk about later, but just wanted to call out that's a new strategy. Nintendo Direct. Wow, Nintendo doesn't really give you much warning that these are coming. I saw it like the day before, like, hey, everybody, Nintendo Direct is tomorrow. So a few notable announcements that I saw that I was kind of interested in. There's a new Zelda game called Echoes of Wisdom. For the very first time, you get to play a Zelda 
And of course, they don't let her use a sword because, you know, why would we allow a woman to wield a sword? But she does get a special power. It's an echo power. So basically, anytime you encounter an object, you copy and paste it into the world. Like if you encounter a table, you can copy the table, paste it, and use it to climb up stuff. So it was kind of a cute new top-down version of that. A new Mario Party for this fall. You get to play with 20 friends. I didn't even know you could play on a Switch with 20 other people. And then for many people, Metroid Prime 4 is exciting. I think they announced that back in 2017, and so it launches next year with the original developer. Gorilla Tag has topped 100 million in revenue, making it one of VR's most successful games. Did you want to troll me and troll Cress with this post? <laughs> Cress, most likely. No, oh this God. is this is this has Cress all over it. No, so I'm... yeah, I just, I just saw the news. They made 100 million in revenue on a VR game. Talk about unicorn. Yeah, yeah, yeah. that's a unicorn. Well, one game does not a platform make, is what I would say. But yeah. yeah, this game's actually done quite well, according to the press release. So, you know, VR, it's here to stay. Yeah, I mean, Beat Saber probably was the other one to get up there, but I haven't heard anything else about VR. I've been hearing a lot about that Batman game. They've been pl- paying yeah. a lot of money to get Arkham Shadow or something like that, yeah. where everything that you see about the game has nothing to do with VR. <laughs> it's pretty funny. <laughs> I think people are like, oh, it's the next Rocksteady like Arkham series because it's called Arkham Shadow, I, w- I would have to imagine the consumer confusion is really high on that. Anyway, and then the final one, Phil, you sent me this email. Thank you. Roblox has rolled out video ads to all advertisers, enabling seamless integration within immersive experiences to reach our 13-year-old plus community because, God forbid, <laughs> you know, we can't go against the law and uh, advertise to <laughs> kids under 13. So more yeah. on that if you want to go check that out. I highly recommend it if you <laughs> want to reach kids. Send your advertising videos to our nine-year-olds that are saying they're 15 so that they can use certain <laughs> features on Roblox. Thanks. That, it's like the Copa Surgeon General. Copa compliant. <laughs> okay. We're Copa. We're Copa. <laughs> Copa compliant. Let's go. Let, hold on. Right, there, there, yeah. there is an angle here. Let's let's see how this turns up in the quarterly earnings. This is one of their big plays to advertising. Eric has shit on in-game advertising forever. We all have, and we should, because it's been tried a million times. But maybe this is the exception that, that proves the rule. I don't know. But let's see how this performs. I actually think this is a pretty big deal. I agree with you. For the record, I'm hearing absolutely horror stories from a development perspective on how ads are being integrated. They can't sell the inventory and... It just is not working yet. I, but not that it won't work in the future, but it's a shit show over there. The tech is difficult, right? The tech is very difficult to get that set up. Once they get, get it set up, I think there's a lot to come from them for sure. If that doesn't work, let's go back to native marketing. And again, the uh, the Gucci Roblox <laughs> shops and whatever they did. <laughs> they still so do absurd. those. <laughs> it was so absurd. <laughs> The other uh, Netflix metaverse and and <laughs> but let's talk about something equally fun. Embracer Group has closed the deal ah. to divest U.S. based game developer <laughs> Gearbox Entertainment to U.S. based gaming holding Take Two Interactive Software for four hundred and sixty million dollars. Final part of the transaction. Nobody cares, but there's an interesting point that they have to settle additional remuneration obligations for Lost Boys Interactive. So that comes as a caveat as a part of the deal of closing that studio. U.S.-based game tech company Astrocade has raised $12 million in a seed funding round from NVIDIA Ventures and from other investors. The fund will fuel the development of an AI-based platform, Casual Games, currently in closed alpha testing that enables users to create UGC games and share them with other users. So this sounds like hype hype. If you are familiar with that game, it's backed by Supercell and I think Benchmark, if I'm correct, out of Finland. But this is uh, most likely not mobile or maybe it's a cross-platform. But anyways, UGC, casual games, AI. So that seems to be a, a holy combination to get some cash. And final investment news. I can't go any of these without Web3. So I found this one. Hong Kong-based Web3 gaming platform Yuliverse has raised $4 million in a pre-Series A funding. So another pre-Series A, aka seed extension, because they failed to reach traction till date. 
And there was a link. So I had to go on the site. I was like, what is Yuliverse? And on the on the main page, like when you open up, it says SART final airdrop farming. And it's SART with like a dollar S-A-R-T. I don't know what's going on, but, <laughs> but it's it's ludicrous. And I love all of this Web3 stuff. This is this is my favorite stuff. So yeah. Sounds legit company. <laughs> So there was a little bit of news last week that Mike Verdu, who is the head of Netflix Games, is moving on to a different role in the company, leaving the lead position open. And Cress immediately was everywhere taking a victory lap. So we give you the floor to take your public victory lap. Please go. (laughs) Well, again, I have to do some hats off to the PR of this industry where lemonade out of lemons. Yeah, I mean, it's like... So, so this was the quote, Mike Verdu leaves as company ramps up its ambitions in the video game space. I mean, what a crock of shit, okay? Like, I mean, look, I love Mike Verdu. I think he's a great guy. He, he is actually an amazing leader. I think he, he is one of those people that has like one of the best reputations in this industry and, and I'm not pooping on him at all. And even though I'm doing a bit of a victory lap because I think I was right in the sense that something was afoot in Netflix gaming, like things are not going well when your leader is let go without a replacement, right? If there's no succession plan internally or externally or whatever, then this was a shock or some kind of like event has occurred that is signs that things are not going well, which is exactly what I said like two weeks ago, all right, whatever, right? But what we really don't know is why Verdu is leaving and I still don't really know for sure. Mr. Kress, I had heard that so he didn't leave the company. He's moving to a different project yeah. inside of Netflix, leading like a new team or leading development or so it is transmedia the typical, probably transmedia. You know, we don't know for sure, but it's not the typical like he was fired or he's leaving the company. He is moving to something else inside of the gaming group to lead another game team. So d- that's perhaps what is going on. However, it doesn't necessarily change what you're saying. No. And I think it's more, it is more PR and more fluff as well. My guess is that he'll probably be out in the next six to 12 months, if I were to guess. Why do they need to make an announcement at all? I don't get this. Just fire him and move on. I don't understand. Netflix has never been shy about this. <laughs> what, what, why, why, are they, why are they pussyfooting around this? No, I think Purdue was going to leave and then, then they, they want to make, okay. make nice, nice. Okay. So there's not him make it a in PR. His Basically. Yeah, but that's so why didn't what I they think. fire him then? <laughs> like, why didn't they fire him? Like, it, it, well, Netflix because they, they don't want to make it. What's crazy about this Netflix thing is that I I go out there and put this shit out there, and I get there is no response from Netflix. Like, they don't give they they don't give a shit about anything. There is no PR or messaging around gaming that's going on, right? Like, there is no PR department for Netflix gaming. It seems, and so they want to control the message that everything is fine, right? And that Purdue is doing something else in the business and you know we're, we're just doing okay. what we do right that seems it's really so confusing weird because yeah. in the in the book like phil like in, even in the book like i love the no rules rules they always talk about like how you have to be very truthful and transparent mm-hmm. and if somebody's being let go like in that culture let go is not always negative it's like you've completed your mission the company is now going to this direction thank you so much for your service till this point you know let's shake hands and best of luck and like in this case it's kind of confusing because they're saying that like, hey, thank you for getting us to this point. We're going to head out. We're going to, you know, ramp up. But you're still like, you're going to go to a position that we're not going to announce. We're not going to say <laughs> who's the next person. It's like so not Netflix. This yeah. sounds like, you know, Disney. So I, I think one of the things I would mention, and this is something that happened at Amazon Games, is that the games org really started to become more and more disconnected from the mainstream corporate culture at Amazon, the worse the performance was. The annex got bigger and bigger. And I start to yeah. wonder if this is the case at Netflix Games, that they understand from the beginning that games are very different. And so they've given them leeway to run their own shop. And these are the results. Yeah. And again, what we don't know and where I would be, have an absolute victory lap is if, you know, the gaming group is getting sunsetted, right? In the next 12 months, we just don't know that. Or are they willing to get a new leader and figure out a strategy that manifests itself over the next three years, right? Is that the next thing, right? And then I'd be wrong, right? I'm, that's not what I think is happening, but I could be, yeah, I, I really have no idea. I'll be honest. Yeah. We're just speculating. I, if I made the, since I wrote the article that came out 
was it on Monday? Yeah, I, I wrote a, an article that came out on Monday. Thanks, Phil, for helping on that about the uh, the Netflix strategy. So it, just to summarize it, like my, my whole point was around three things that was going not maybe so well at Netflix games. And of course, I gave a ton of kudos to Verdu as, as he has a great reputation. But the three things that are challenging for them is like the first of all is product market fit. It has the same fallacy that Apple Arcade had, which is assuming that mobile games that we have now in the market, they will be better if you just remove the ads and the in-app purchases. And that's not true. And then like you see Netflix games acquiring these games, like the SpongeBob game that that, uh, Tilting Point published, they have that exact same game. They just take away the ads and the in-app purchases and does way less downloads. And like, what's the point when you can take that game and have been able to take that game for years off the app store for free, watch ads, progress faster as we're making up purchases. So weird sort of a product market fit, not even talking about all the niche Steam games that they have been releasing that are like four, five, six years old. The second one is is this sort of a the ROI aspect. So the way I see it, and I don't think this is controversial, every single business invests into activities that either grow revenue or grows profitability. And those are achieved either directly or indirectly through the investments that it makes. And so in Netflix games perspective, I don't think they currently bring any new subscribers. There's no sort of a, like a house of cards version of games where you're like, I must play this one. You can only get it through Netflix games. They don't monetize directly. There's no ads. There's no in-app purchases. And based on the public data, again, they haven't rebuted this in the PR. The CBS article was talking about, at least in 2022, that only 1% of Netflix subscribers were playing these games. And and people are, of course, debunking this, that it's an old thing since then, so many downloads have happened, et cetera, et cetera. But you could say, okay, maybe they've tripled the amount of players. Okay, now it's 3% that have been playing once a month. Like, that's still not enough when we know that the latest live roast of... um, Tom Not Brady. Tom Hardy, Tom Brady. Tom, Tom Hardy. Brady. <laughs> Tom Hardy. That's the next one. But the Tom Brady did like, I, I think it did like 260 million views. So and good. That's like, so yeah. good. The goat delivers. <laughs> and, oh. and, and now they're now they're bringing in SmackDown, Monday Night Raw. Are they going to bring NFL or is that Amazon? Like, like Amazon life right sports no, they, are coming. They are bringing NFL. So, so Boom. Uh, like this is a whole, yes. Live yeah. sports is a strategy because it is the only appointment viewing that really matters anymore, except for exactly. HBO Sunday night, House of the Dragon season one or season two, episode one. Very good <laughs> if you haven't seen it. But okay. no, 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 these things are. But, you know, I think your point is that um, how do you create the gotta have app from Netflix that isn't too hot to handle or too hot to handle too? Yeah. <laughs> Keep going. And, and and especially since since it's a company and it invests in different things, so it invests into these other, the live sports, live shows aspect, and it sees immediate, massive return on that. And then you see games like, oh, you know, the traction is pretty nice. Like we've gone from like X amount of downloads to the X amount of downloads. It's like uncomparable. And this is an aggressive culture, aggressive company that needs hyper growth, not like year over year, 20% growth. And then finally is, I used a quote from Spry Fox. So Spry Fox is an indie developer, triple something. I remember they had uh, this, where you match three. That was their their, their, their first. I don't remember, but they were bought by Netflix. Yeah. Yeah, And then they were, it's an indie developer. They made really cute games and they were bought by indie developer. And and in the uh, the quote that basically the CEO was saying like, oh my God, like it's so great to finally just focus on like fun and and just you know fulfilling the dreams of the players and not worry about the business at all. And to me that sounded kind of crazy like you're 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 <laughs> early 2000s you, you have no called. connection. <laughs> yeah, you, you have no connection to business. Even as an indie developer, you have to think about like you're having some kind of impact. If you're not thinking about impact, you know, I kind of describe it as like a Willy Wonka's chocolate factory of game development where you can get like a six seven figure salary just to make fun games, of course, all of us would sign up any moment if we don't have to actually, you know, have any type of a business impact. So it's an interesting case and kind of like, you know, we talked about what happens to Verdu, but what I wanted to ask the crew here is like, if you were in a position in like a corp dev or or advising Netflix, would you still continue internal development or kind of pull back where you were before and just go to licensing, go to like Disney, like here are all the licenses, do the games. Look, I was like the biggest bull on this thing when it first came out because I thought they would be able to create new experiences that would bring in new audiences, right? But they haven't done that at all. Like 
their biggest win is a GTA trilogy that that <laughs> downloads a gajillion times that they spent Which insane fifty existed. million dollars for. What the fuck? Those stats should be just removed from the entire calculus, right? And it's so like they're just stumbling along and they're not doing anything unique, and that doesn't make it interesting. And what you guys are pointing to is the same idea: is like they got other fish to fry that are actually generating significant upticks like yeah like the roasts and sports and all this other stuff these are what gaming is competing with internally at netflix netflix yes. doesn't give a fuck okay they want results right and they're, they're getting results from these investments and not these and this is exactly why i said the last time why the marketing group feels fucking super fine with building out the bullshit experiences on roblox with no input at all from the gaming group it's like yeah, go ahead. Who gives a shit? This is our biggest competitor on the same exact platforms and we're going to deliver this shitty content, right? Yeah, great marketing 101 type bullshit, you know? And this is this is what happens, right? And so this is where I was right, right? Now, again, what I don't know is what's going to happen in the next six to 12 months. I have my guess, but we will see. And then I will do a real victory lap and I will be dancing in my basement office here. So moving on. All right. Step into the future of game monetization with Exola, the premier partner for game developers seeking to expand their reach and revenue. Exola provides a robust suite of tools designed to enhance user acquisition, demanded subscriptions, and streamline payment solutions worldwide. Unlock new markets and maximize profitability through their customized, secure payment architecture and dedicated support team. Exola, powering game developers to achieve global success. This podcast is brought to you by Apps Flyer. In today's digital world, understanding your app's journey from discovery to download is more than just insightful, it's essential. Enter Apps Flyer, the leader in mobile attribution and marketing analytics that allows you to measure the full potential of your marketing efforts, making every ad dollar work smarter. With Apps Flyer, that's your new reality. Dive deep into data-driven insights that reveal exactly where your users come from and how they'll interact with your app. Apps Flyer, where your app's potential meets performance. Let's get into games. We did a lot of business shop talk. Let's actually talk about <laughs> games. Lightning Phil. hits rolls on. Uh, Zenless Zone Zero <laughs> has exceeded 40 million pre-registrations. Holy shit. That is massive. I think that's that's the number one of all time. And the thing I keep getting on Instagram is I get a lot of ads for pre-registration for this game. So they're spending a lot of marketing dollars on this. Jen, I, I can't figure out what is the model that makes this worth spending marketing dollars on? Because just intuitively, there's a percent chance of actually downloading the game on iOS that gets introduced if you pre-register. And I think you mentioned Google is auto. Why even introduce that into the funnel? Why not just wait and save your marketing dollars for when this thing is actually ready to launch? What's the theory here? I love the skepticism. So... I actually did pre-reg campaigns in my past and, you know, with anything, there's pros and cons and with anything, it depends on the KPIs that you're seeing, but there's a lot of pros. So number one is the CPIs for pre-reg tend to be much, much lower than when you actually launch, especially on Google UAC, especially if you're a really big game and you can talk to Google and maybe work out some deals, right? Because they want to do that with certain games. They have a specific product in UA that is built for this. It's really cheap. It's really frictionless. It's really player forward. And so if you have a larger game, call your Google people and be like, talk to me about a pre-reg campaign and how that works. It also allows you to build audiences in countries that you might want to run closed beta tests in. So how we used it was really interesting. We did pre-reg campaigns. We brought people in. Once you are pre-registered, you can move those players into closed beta tests. And you know you've got like a really good dedicated player that's gonna give you good results in the testing. And so there's actually a game component to that that is a benefit by having people pre-registered for your game. So you can get, you know, like really good KPIs there. It's also just a really good way to start to build the buzz. So you are doing, in a sense, awareness driving, getting people to know about the game so that you're leading into your launch and making your launch a little bit better. Uh, it's a way to get data earlier. This is why I was so surprised when Squadbusters only did a month in soft launch. So typically, 
in the world of UA too, especially with pre-reg campaigns or even just regular UA campaigns, you need the time to get the data. How are those users performing? How is paid versus organic actually performing, giving us more time to kind of track through on retention for those players, on monetization for those players? It's nice to get that data, which Squad Busters didn't really do. We'll talk about that in a little bit, like what did that hurt them or not? So remember that UA channels need this time to train their data. So with machine learning, with everything going on, you at least have to have a couple of weeks in there for all of your UA channels to like learn and optimize. So if you're doing that at launch, it just delays everything and it doesn't allow you to get all of that going. And you know, as you, as you know, golden cohort's still a thing, my friend. And so having all of your best players in there right when it launches is typically a, an amazing thing. On many of my games, the golden cohort was still playing the game two or three years later. It's like super crazy. However, the cons, unclear conversion, as we know, if soft launch drags on, they just might lose interest and be like, ah, something's wrong with this game. Like, I think that happened a little bit with Warzone. Remember, they were like, they kept pushing and pushing. So if you pre-reg too early, it could be against you. And then obviously Warzone had a little bit of issue with tech when it launched. And so if you've got an issue at launch, those are your most valuable people. And if you, you know, as we all know in mobile, you get, you get like five minutes with someone, not even, you get like a minute with someone, if you lose them, like they're gone forever. So I don't know, does that help? One, yeah. one more angle that I think is really interesting here is that when you hit the pre-registration on the Instagram ads, you head to the website, you don't head to the store pages. They want you to make a Hoyoverse account. And I think they want to establish you having a relationship with them over email. They want direct to consumer because they're going to push web stores on you. And not only that, they can push all the different angles of the game. So remember, this one's not going to just be on iOS or Android. This has an Epic Game Store and a Steam distribution coming. Or at least I think there's a Steam distribution coming. So I, th I think there might be another case here that goes back to a lot of the regulation we're hearing, like you can now do this. You can send emails to people directly with web store offers. You can circumvent the store entirely. So it'll be interesting to see if we see more of this as we go forward, not using the store, but using your own personal account and email. I mean, that's our choice to do that, right? Like you can send people directly to the store for a frictionless experience. That's pretty smart if they want to collect the consumer data though. So no, I, I hear you on that. And I think, Jen, you wanted to talk about a brand marketing campaign that has gone awry? I don't, I don't yeah, know. You, yes. you tell me. Yes. Yes. Whoa. So <laughs> The returns are in. So I, Game Refinery does like a monthly recap and, and they, they talk about all kinds of events. And so we had talked about this creative, which was Holland, who is the kind of the world's best footballer right now, did the Clash of Clans partnership where he was in live action and they turned him into a character in the game. And so in this Game Refinery article, they talked about the event that happened actually didn't drive more revenue or downloads than past seasonal updates. And so I think we had heard this was probably around a $5 million creative asset just for the asset, not even for any of the other promotional materials or the media or the integration costs. Um, there are many, many times I would go, I mean, Phil, you're, you probably, you were the recipient of this. I come to you as the marketer and be like, Hey, I got, you got to make Holland a character in the game. You got to make a whole event. And you guys are like, Oh, that costs us so much. It takes us so much time. And so to not see an impact, it could be a lot of things. You can't just point to to Holland as not being a good fit, you have to also look at, you know, what was the event? What was the skin? What was all the other things? But oof, this is kind of uh, not good news. Phil, what do you think? It's down over the period. There was a little bit of a bump. I think they did some pre-hype that this was coming to the game, but basically it looks like zero impact. Yeah, I, I'm bummed for them. It always hurts, right? Because when you're a marketer and you've got like, hey, I have this great idea, let's do this, and it doesn't work, everyone like takes out the guns and starts pointing at you like, oh, marketer, it's all your fault. So Oh, save that, save that when we talk about squad busters. Um, <laughs> other news coming down this week, Paradox Interactive has canceled potential Sims rival Life by You. I heard this is a $20 million write-off and the devs were informed weeks before launch. They missed a bunch of release dates for this game. I think it was around three. I'm, I'm just really bummed about this because my, my predominant thesis is that The Sims is fat 
And, you know, as Bezos said, your margin is my opportunity. And there's a lot of opportunity this life sim game that no one seems to go after, except for Lilith Games, which announced Project Party this week, which I'm super excited about. Lilith continues to surprise me. This is apparently going to be a Sims competitor from the sound of it. It says in the press release, the full game will include activities like going on an island vacation, crafting and social features, numerous mini games, as well as the ability to create UGC content, including a comprehensive game edit. So I'm super excited for Lilith to tear into this. They continue to surprise and delight. We'll have an update in FK Journey in future weeks, which doesn't look that great right now, but this seems very exciting. I'm super jazzed that someone is still trying to play this thesis out. But there's also Inzoi. Remember, we, we talked about this. Oh, the, the, really the South Korean one? <laughs> yeah, it's a very unfortunate name, but, uh, but they are definitely coming out again to go after this market as well. So another small update I wanted to provide on Marvel Snap. It is in free fall. It is in complete and utter free fall ever since they announced that, that funding. If you look at where they were on, let's say, December 1st of this year, and you compare it to where we are right now in terms of daily active users, when we're looking at sensor tower data, we went from around 900,000 DAU to around 600,000 DAU. It is not looking pretty. I remember a lot of people were coming out talking about potentially the sticky core of this game. Where are they? Because we haven't hit rock bottom on this game yet, and it does not look good. They're shaving the U off, which is not Damn. on multiverse. They, they raised 100 Sorry. million, right? Yep. Publisher was okay. a part of this, and live opping a game is a core part of being a publisher, and it looks like this is not going well right now. Speaking of live operations, a quick update on multiverses and the finals. The finals launched season three, which had a small uptick, but this still does not look good for the finals. This uptick for season three was lower than Jesus. the uptick they had for season two. Multiverses, on the other hand, doesn't look that great either. I thought there was a relatively slower decline than we've seen in previous games. Adam Telfer pointed out that's probably not the case, and it doesn't look like it's the case here. The only piece of countervailing evidence I've seen for multiverses when, you know, at least you look at Steam data, it doesn't look great. And that's what we see because Steam reports actuals. But when we look at Circana data, uh, multiverses looks a lot better. And you got to remember, this is weekly active users only in the United States. If you look at where they are in the ranks on PlayStation Multiverses is still in fifth, sixth position from last week, so it hasn't fallen. It's fallen off Xbox, and it's fallen a little bit on Steam. And again, this is just Steam US. We looked at global numbers previously, but I still think there might be a life to this game on console. Let's continue to see what the Circana updates say. This is, again, a very particular slice of data, but it didn't look that awful yet. Um, one other note here, no Hell Divers on PlayStation, which is very mm. strange to see, uh, only, only on Steam for a particular audience. Uh, moving on, quick update. I mean, we have we have to mention it, which is the banana game. Uh, for anyone who oh, wants to, and I will, I will make a quick scam. The banana I, scam. The banana scam. I will do a quick four one one on this because it, it deserves to be talked about. The banana game is on Steam. It is a clicker game. You log into the game. Uh, there's a banana. You click on it, and randomly you get uh, another banana as a drop rate. And that's it. That is the game. And you may be wondering, why is this blown up? Why is this now the number one game on Steam? Well, the bananas are usable on the Steam Marketplace, so you can trade them. The developer gets a 10% cut, and I think they're doing around $100 million in volume, so probably around $10 million for these developers. You don't know, by the way, if the developers are listing bananas directly on the store. We have, we have no way to identify that. Everything's anonymous. This is pure Web3 shit. This is nothing new. This is, I'm surprised it took this long. This is played earned. There's actually another clicker that's blown up, this hamster game for Web3, which is the same idea. This, this is all bots. We know there's a lot of Russian and Chinese players when you look at the reviews. Um, this is pure speculation. Why would you want to sell a banana? Because other people value bananas. This thing's going to blow up and, you know, this, this thing will go to zero pretty quickly. There's already copycats. You can play cucumber. Um, yep, there isn't, there isn't a whole lot that's interesting here. People like to speculate. What else is new? <laughs> it, it happens when you have a marketplace. Squad Busters. Uh, quick, quick update there. I think there's two pieces to this. One is the KPI update. And I think the second is the, uh, the in business, or excuse me, uh, Game Industry Insider, Game Industry Biz, uh, update that they had. There was an interview with Aino, who is the leader of the product, and there's also an interview with Rob as well. They're, they're in one interview. He's the head of marketing, and I, I feel like they're already doing damage control in this game. I hope to have a Squad Busters one month later piece. I'm going to eat a ton of crow on this game. It looks like it's in the shitter right now, to be honest with you. I wanted to wait a month to look at the KPIs and see how it's going, but every indication looks like it's not going well. And the, I would say the interview is not a good look either from Mr. Rob Lowe. He was saying that in an ideal world, you know, we would have liked to have a longer period in soft launch. 
what, what are you talking about? You make these decisions in an ideal world. You get to make that world. And not only that, it, it feels like like marketing made the decision on a launch date for this game. He spends a lot of time talking about the launch strategy and the analysis that they did. But it looks like marketing was making a decision for launch date on this game, which looks like a shift of power inside of Supercell. Normally, I would say that the teams make this sort of decision. This feels like, hey, we hired all these new people. We hired a lot of brand marketers. Let's let them make this call. And uh, the first time the brand marketers make a call on this, it looks like a, they screwed the pooch on this. He already looks like he's defending himself. He talks about profitability. They're already heading towards profitability on that ad we were mentioning, the one with Chris Helmsworth. And let's call Matei and Joseph. What do you mean by profitability uh, You know, on the ad, on the UA? What are we talking about here? It is looking grim for Squad Busters. I would say the most damning thing we could probably look at with this game is that the daily active users for Squad Busters is far below either the launch of... Brawl Stars, it is below the launch of Clash of Clans, it is below the launch of seeing almost every one of their games. Their daily active users look comparable to Heyday. And look at, I love Heyday. Congratulations to them for keeping this thing going for so long. But you need to grow daily active users if you want to make money. And right now, they don't seem to be able to do that. It is very troubling right now. There could be a huge series of damage control over the coming weeks, depending on how this thing turns. And it looks like it's starting to turn. Yeah, this is fantastic. Like, I don't know. So first of all, I don't doubt Rob. Rob is the golden twig winner from 2023 with the uh, with the collaboration of Lego and Fortnite. But yeah, it was a confusing interview about the game. Like I've been playing every day. I'm not forcing myself. I think the full core is fun, but there's absolutely no sense of progress, to be honest. There's no incentive to pay. At least I haven't felt that. And when I looked at the Sensor Tower numbers, so Phil, you have those graphs and, and everybody watching on YouTube will see this or Spotify. Downloads have been 3x what Brawl Stars did in the beginning when I was comparing this. The revenue per download is, of course, a fraction because you have so many downloads coming in. But what has been worrisome is since the beginning, the revenue itself has been about 40% less than what Brawl Stars did at launch. And then when looking at the sensor tower numbers, again, these are uh, estimates, but the active user base is just collapsing. It is going down really, really fast. And that is a big problem since this has been what the biggest launch in supercell history at least that was the impetus that they wanted to have the biggest like the most invested into a launch and i believe it is in terms of like how many downloads they got during the first month i think this is the record and they had an update this week was it yesterday or a day before so there was a new map new characters you know i'm playing but it, it didn't like blow my socks off. They, there wasn't any competitive features. It still to me feels like this is what, where I've been feeling for a few weeks now, like a high quality, super high quality hybrid casual game without ad monetization. Like it is very marketable. It is super engaging and inc incredibly accessible because, you know, a couple of fingers and you, just, you can play it in one finger. There's very, very limited progression the characters are not that deep. And then there's very limited social. That's where I'm at right now, playing I, I every day disagree. and waiting. That's good. Tell me why. This, this, so this, the, the biggest thing that I've shifted my priors on with this game's launch is that the Supercell IP isn't worth much. This is a game Oof, that crams all... That would be all, horrible. Yep, I, I think it is. And, and, you know, it's interesting. Rob mentions, you know, the Barbarian being one of the few recognizable characters. And you go back to them paying for the, um, you know, the Summer Game Fest trailer and trying to, I think, expand their brand to a traditional demo. But you're telling me they got, you know, 39 million, maybe 40 downloads, you know, life to date for the game. And they did 40 million in pre-registrations. And we saw most of the downloads are in Tier 3 or Tier 2 countries. You're kidding me. I mean, that's a, that's a joke. I mean, the Supercell IP should be doing way better than that. Should be doing way, way better than that. They're not able to push volume into this game. That is a huge problem. I think it's, I, to me, it's a top of funnel problem right now. And I am extremely troubled, extremely troubled that they're not pushing higher downloads. That is sad to see. Wait, wait, hold on. Okay, let, okay. let me just, the two points here. One, the beta thing that he said makes no fucking sense, right? This is not like a difference between one-year beta and two-year beta. This is a difference between three month beta, right? Like the, the beta process on this thing didn't make sense from the get-go. And what I said early during the beta process is it wasn't monetizing. And that's exactly what's happened at launch. It's like 50 cents per download. Well, well hold on, hold on. Arp, ArpDAO is actually high, is actually historically high in the portfolio. It's around 14 cents. It's actually clobbering the other games. Now, now I think that to play the math because it's survivorship bias, you only have the most interested users. Yes. But, but I would say Arp, Arp, I think ArpDAO is a better measure here than revenue per download. But, but your point stands. Yeah. 
But I don't understand what your point is about downloads. They have 44 million downloads in like a few months. That's not terrible. I, I, that's like a power two, of the brand. Tier two and tier three downloads and all that pre-registration ammo. That seem, that's sad right, to me. Right, that's fluff. So th- that's the same point, right? The quality is shit, right? Yeah. But when you have something that makes 50 cents per download or even a dollar 20 in the US, something like that, then like you can't spend against that profitably. Like it's impossible, right? That's the main problem. And so like, why would you ever do a three month beta for a product that was monetizing in this shitty way you know, and this whole thing didn't make sense. This is what we said before. It's like, you wouldn't, why are you publishing this so fast? Just like figure out the mon- long-term monetization. So, Correct. Uh, Especially if you look at downloads right now, which are under Brawl Stars and Brawl Stars is also doing UA and, and UA effectively. In fact, they have an ad right now that is a caters to every eight-year-old boy and all of us. It is an ad with a poop emoji that comes on and you, you can play the poop emoji in the game is what it, it looks like. It's taking up all of the freshman share of voice on Brawl Star ads, but with Squad Busters coming in under the downloads. So basically it's like a big giant poop emoji that becomes a playable character <laughs> inside of Brawl Stars. And so you're running around shooting people <laughs> as the poop emoji. And, and so this is like, listen, we know that Brawl Stars appeals to, you know, teens and, and kids. Uh, you couldn't have a better piece of creative that's been running for the last two months. And I just have to think that, you know, is there cannibalization? Like Squad Busters is well under the downloads of Brawl Stars right now. Now that we are in past the launch window for the last couple of weeks, we are seeing Squad Busters not being able to compete on downloads. So that's troubling on the UA front, right? So UA is not converting, which you can also, to my earlier point, go back and say, well, you probably didn't give yourself enough time to train your UA to make sure that you could actually bring people in the top of the funnel, Phil, to your point. And then you look at revenue and revenue is like way under. It's like a quarter of the Brawl Star revenue right now. I'm just worried for them. I think Rob also might've been doing some damage control. Okay. Again, what didn't make sense is that they already had Brawl Stars crushing it. They didn't need this game. Like they didn't need to sell the story. Why wouldn't they just wait? What happened? Agree. Mishka. So, so the, dude, you're the, the so, okay. one that's connected right. out there in the middle of fucking I, nowhere. I'm gonna, I'm Tell gonna us do what a the hypothesis. fuck's going on. Uh, um, this is a hypothesis. Somebody in the higher up makes a call and sets a date for a launch, which is very unique and it should never be done with free to play games. And they start executing because based on the article, they he's saying that the date was set and preferably they wanted to have more time. So somebody set that date. Was it the Summer Games Fest? Because Rob also talked I a lot know. about convincing the Summer Game Fest folks to buy the commercial, which, by yeah. the way, was over half a million dollars to get the placement. I was like, no, not yeah. worth it. So, 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 so there, there has to be, like, like you said, like it was marketing let, which is very unique because normally it's game led. And somehow something happened where marketing took over and started leading like in traditional publishing companies. And I think there is a come to Jesus moment coming in to the marketing organization if this game flops, because it was their call to set up all these dates, to create all this hype, to deliver on the biggest launch that the company ever had and going before the product. So I think there will be like, this is just a hypothesis. This is just me thinking about it. But if the hypothesis that marketing took the lead, then it's the marketing's head that's going to roll. Oh, I feel so sad because I always, in free-to-play games, always say product comes first. You can never, ever market your way out of a leaky bucket. I lived this in my past on Farmville. They they were like, yeah. Jen, go do this TV. Can-. I joined Farmville and they're like, we had, they had developed a, a TV commercial and we were in test market and I looked at the numbers on retention. I'm like, We are canceling this TV campaign because we have a leaky bucket. Like this is the dumbest thing ever to put all of this money into TV if all people are going to do is flow out. So perhaps that's the case here. I don't know. It's what it's looking like. And I just don't want to say on Rob because the way I understand it, Rob sits on the game team and he's the marketing team, like marketing lead on that team. And if these type of decisions have to be, have been made, then they have to be made at the leadership level. And so we know Supercell has, has a new CMO. This has to be coming in from the highest up where the, the leadership was convinced to go this way and this route to launch it big 
and to do the biggest launch they've ever done and the game team as well as the game marketing executed against the will of the leadership. This is my hypothesis. We'll see Please in a matter back. of months how yeah. this is going to play out. <laughs> Got it. No, I, I like your crystal ball, your magic eight ball on if somebody's head could roll, is it going to be the CMO, the head of the games? No, they'll go lead the innovation group. They'll lead a new group at Supercell. <laughs> Yeah, but but yeah, they're the Spark Labs. But the way the, the Supercell is is a, is a very Netflix. You know, they love the Netflix culture. It's it's a very much. If you want to take the shot, you take the shot. But then you take the responsibility. If you make the shot, you're gonna you're gonna win the magical prize. And if you miss the shot, you're you know, out. You get the exactly hook. exactly. That's the Netflix game you play. So all right, all right, everyone. Thanks for hanging in there, and see you next week. Later. Later. You did it. You made it to the end of the episode. As a fan of the show, it would help us out if you subscribe and leave us a review on the podcast service of your choice. More importantly, are you a member of the Deconstructor of Fun Slack group? If you have five years or more of games industry experience, go to deconstructorofun.com slash slack and apply to join. Join the games industry's best professional community filled with peers always willing to lend a hand. Or subscribe to our newsletter to get all the latest insights from the Deconstructor of Fun content creators. Thanks for listening.